Top Girls serves as a profound exploration into the challenges of navigating life within a patriarchal society. Carol Churchill's play opens with a surreal scene where Marlene, a successful businesswoman in London celebrating a recent promotion, hosts a dinner party. Her guests include historical and fictional women spanning different eras and cultures, women whose lives were shaped and often shattered by patriarchal norms throughout history. This setting underscores Churchill's argument that patriarchal dominance is deeply entrenched. Making it hard to envision life outside its confines even in 20th century London Churchill vividly illustrates how patriarchy exerts insidious control over women's lives. Suggesting that true liberation requires breaking free from its constraints. The women at the dinner party share stories of lives defined by servitude to men, revealing the pervasive negative impact of such existence. Lady Nijo, for instance, a concubine-turned-Buddhist nun from 13th-century Japan, recounts a life groomed from birth to serve the emperor. Despite the horror her story evokes in others, Nijo herself admits to internalizing her subservient role, conditioned by circumstances that offered no escape from patriarchal bondage similarly. Patient Griselda, a figure from the Canterbury Tales, endures extreme tests of obedience imposed by her husband over decades, while Pope Joan, who disguised herself as a man to become Pope in the Middle Ages, reflects on the erasure of her own womanhood amid wielding power until her tragic end. Marlene initially believes her recent success shields her from such tales of oppression. Yet confronting these narratives during the dinner party reveals how deeply patriarchy still affects her life. Returning to her work at the Top Girls Employment Agency, Marlene encounters further evidence of patriarchal dynamics when the wife of a colleague pleads with her to relinquish her promotion for the sake of her husband's pride. This encounter highlights the complex psychological effects of patriarchy. Mrs. Kidd, who has subordinated her own aspirations to support her husband, feels betrayed by Marlene's success. Viewing it as a threat to her sacrifices and sense of worth, Churchill portrays Marlene's realization that even her achievements in a male-dominated world do not shield her from patriarchy's grip. The play's opening scene, with its diverse and harrowing tales, underscores the suffocating reality of life under patriarchy. As Marlene carries the insights gleaned from the dinner party back into her daily life, she realizes that her corporate success, while notable, cannot erase the fundamental patriarchal structures that shape her existence. Top Girls showcases a spectrum of women's stories, blending historical accounts with fictional narratives to emphasize the vitality and necessity of women sharing their experiences in a patriarchal world. Churchill's use of both real and imagined characters challenges the historical erasure of women's voices, arguing for the intrinsic value of every woman's story. Top Girls, premiering at the Royal Court Theatre on August 28, 1982, unfolds across three acts featuring an all-female cast, characterized by a non-linear narrative structure. Act 1 unfolds at a celebratory dinner hosted by Marlene at a restaurant on a Saturday night, commemorating her recent promotion at the Top Girls Employment Agency. The guests include both historical and fictional women, each recounting their achievements and struggles within a male-dominated society. Historical figures such as Isabella Bird, Lady Nijo, and Pope Joan, along with fictional characters like Dulgret and Patient Griselda, illustrate various responses to patriarchal oppression. While some women accept their subordinate roles, others, like Pope Joan, 
challenge these norms by disguising themselves to ascend within a male-dominated hierarchy. Churchill's exploration of motherhood in Act I reveals divergent attitudes among women towards maternal identity. Characters like Patient Griselda and Lady Nijo experience motherhood as an imposed burden, dictated by male expectations and societal norms. Griselda, for instance, obediently relinquishes her children to satisfy her husband's tests of obedience, while Lady Nijo endures similar male coercion within the imperial court. Their experiences underscore Churchill's critique of patriarchal structures that constrain women's autonomy and redefine their identities through male-defined roles. In contrast, women like Isabella Byrd and Pope Joan reject conventional motherhood to pursue individual ambitions. Bird's passion for travel and devotion to her sister and horses substitute traditional maternal roles, reflecting her defiance of Victorian societal expectations. Pope Joan, having risen to the papacy disguised as a man, denies her maternal identity altogether, reflecting Churchill's exploration of gender identity and societal constraints. Joan's pregnancy bewilders her, as she has long identified as male, having lived and presented as a man since adolescence. She confesses her discomfort with her female body, utterly unfamiliar with its physiological realities such as pregnancy and childbirth. Exposing her profound disconnection from gender and biological sex. Her lack of bodily awareness contributes tragically to her demise. Tysa humorously notes Joan's labor pains, divorced from her womanhood and caught off guard by the biological process, recalling feeling discomfort during a regation day procession. Initially attributing it to food, only later did she realize her pregnancy, choosing to endure silently during the ceremony. Her childbirth, described as animalistic, involved primitive sounds akin to a cow's lowing as her child was born on the road. Other women find Joan's ordeal amusing until they learn of her subsequent stoning, silencing their laughter abruptly. Joan's stoning underscores the dominant male force asserting control over her, punishing her for deviating from societal norms concerning women. Adesicia highlights her defiance of Roman Catholic Church law barring women from becoming Pope, leading to her brutal execution. Marol observes Joan's self-condemnation, lamenting her gender and acknowledging her heretical status, regretting her femininity. Despite challenging the Church's patriarchy by assuming male identity, Joan's fate confirms its unyielding grip, ending her life at the hands of cardinals. In stark contrast stands Dulgret, distinct from her peers. Nijo complies with her role as the Empress concubine as per her father's wishes, whereas Gret, driven by her will, confronts devils in hell. Isabella, contemplative and self-critical, contrasts sharply with Gret's emotional impulsiveness. While Joan and Isabella are articulate and reflective, Gret speaks plainly, reflecting her peasant background. Patient Griselda maintains passive endurance, while Gret, in a fit of madness after losing her children to the Spanish army, seeks vengeance against their killers. Unlike others, Gret retains her maternal instincts despite losing her children, confronting devils in hell to avenge their deaths. Her blunt language challenges patriarchal expectations of female gentleness, donning male armor and wielding a sword, symbolizing her equality with men and heroic spirit. Churchill portrays Gret as a revolutionary figure, defying traditional gender roles. Marlene, the dinner party host, differs markedly from her historical and fictional counterparts, divulging little about herself while prodding others to share. 
Despite this reticence, Marlene, like her guests, grapples with motherhood. She quizzes Joan about abortion, hinting at her own past choices. In Act 3, Marlene reveals having had Angie at 17, leaving her in the care of her sister to pursue career ambitions, a decision unlike that of her peers. Cozy Ravari and Naidu draw parallels between Marlene and Joan, both sacrificing femininity to succeed in a patriarchal society. Adesicia notes Marlene's deliberate avoidance of personal details, masking vulnerabilities that might undermine her professional image. Marlene's casual mention of abortions and sexual experience reveals a pragmatic attitude towards motherhood. Despite rejecting domesticity early in life, Marlene later considers reclaiming Angie, confident in her financial stability and career success. Her dismissive attitude towards Angie's potential mirrors societal expectations that only financially secure, ambitious women can balance work and family. Marlene aligns herself with other successful women, celebrating their collective progress while critiquing less ambitious peers. In conclusion, Churchill's exploration underscores the complex choices women face under patriarchal scrutiny. Whether complying with or resisting societal norms, women endure struggles with identity and autonomy. Act 1 exposes the plight of women like Joan, Gret, and Marlene, navigating societal expectations of gender and motherhood while challenging and conforming to patriarchal systems. Thus, Churchill challenges entrenched notions of femininity, motherhood, and power, offering a provocative commentary on the enduring struggles faced by women against patriarchal oppression.